Yeah. Or did you ever have you read any Jonathan Franzen? He I had that book, it, but, but Eating Animals. Yeah, but no, but all those books, all those Diet for New America, John, you know, all those things. They'll turn you off. I mean, I was living with a vegan until recently. And she, she, we, we yeah. split, but uh, she was vegetarian the first time, you know, and then she became vegan. And then it was just, it's just, it's such an enormous uh, commitment. But you're, at least in New York City, it's, it's. Yeah, super easy. I loved it. I loved it for when I did it for three years. I mean, for many, many reasons. And then I just, either I wasn't eating enough certain things, but I started to feel anemic. And ironically, are we on? Sorry, yeah. Ironically, We're just running now. right before I did Starved, I started eating meat again because I, I was just, my brain wasn't functioning with an acuity that I needed. Right. And I felt anemic. How did that feel after three years? Did well, you know, it's interesting because I, while, while I certainly didn't like, that's a, not even, that's a, a small way to put it. I hated the way animals are treated and stuff. I didn't necessarily do it for ethical reasons when I started. I, understand. I did it for health reasons. But then when I stopped, I didn't realize that I had sort of, the ethics had sort of caught up to me and surpassed almost the mm-hmm. health. And I felt mm. very sad being part of the meat eating community again. Yeah. Uh, but I sort of felt like if my body's not functioning well, I can't help anyone, animals, humans, anybody. Like if I can't think or mm-hmm. I'm going to drop dead. And, and so I started eating meat again, um, sort of against my will, but, but still being 80% vegan. Uh-huh. I would just sort of have animal products. So again, it's just not, this notion of all or nothing, right? It's uh-huh. a, doesn't have to be. If you put everything I eat on a table, it's eighty percent vegan and twenty percent not. Right. I mean, there's also the, the the side to the whole situation where you can be vegetarian but be eating donuts and pizza. Uh, and well, and, sure, you can be completely. You, I mean, uh, radically, un- abjectly unhealthy. It's hard to do that if you're vegan because there's some there's well, not not that much available and you can't eat spontaneously. Well, but you can eat potatoes and bread all day long. Well, it's still I suppose that's huge. true. I mean, right. I, it all I started converts being vegan to sugar, because, right? Well, yeah, you can. Yeah. Well, no. Well, Maybe white not. sugar is processed with animal bones, so uh-huh. vegans, I don't need with white sugar. With animal bones? Yeah, it's processed with animal bones. That I hadn't heard of. Yeah. So so a Me lot too. of vegans I've, won't I've eat my white sugar checker. just for that reason, where you get sugar that's not processed with animal bones. But no, you could be certainly very unhealthy. There's plenty to eat as yeah, a vegan and true. still be. Right. I mean, you could have tempura. You know, you can have fry. You could have. Yeah. Most. It's so oxymoronic. I think most vegans tend not to be. Radically unhealthy. Yeah. Or they go the other way and they get sort of super unhealthy because they don't eat enough. But anyway, I'm eight days back being vegan because I watched this HBO documentary. Which one? I think it was called What the Health. I heard about it, but I haven't seen it. Netflix, not HBO. Either okay. Netflix or... I forget. Doesn't maybe matter. HBO. One not, of the again, I'll have my fact checker on it. Yeah. And I liked it. It was about a guy who... Uh, I'd seen a lot of stuff before. It was... Mm-hmm. Kind of a super size me feeling thing, but he just went and interviewed a lot of people and found that all these people wouldn't discuss almost his policy diet, like the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association. Mm-hmm. When he asked them about <clears throat> diet as a issue, as a preventative for these diseases, that these no one almost his policy said, well, we can't talk about diet. Why do you suppose that was? Well, or because was that would rationale? that would eradicate the disease. Mm-hmm. Ah. And and all these these people, obviously, big pharma, big sure. medical, as an investment right. in keeping you sick, yes, or treating the sickness, not the preventative. Right. So anyway, very interesting, and we saw that, and then just all you have to hear is the word pus with milk and yogurt, and you're not going to eat it. No, it's very mean, true. Ha- well, you know, again, having read Jonathan's book, which is called Eating Animals. It, you know, it's a big, big seller, yeah. big bestseller. And then living with the vegan, and so I approached my son, and I said, I, you know, he was already kind of skeptical about me because I was. He saw me eating a lot less meat and more eating more vegan, like because uh-huh. I just would eat whatever we were eating. When, you were my dating girl, the vegan. when I was living with, yeah. yeah. And I was happy to do it. You know, I mean, I, I when I was out about on my own, I was a little less cautious, admittedly. But uh, and then you know, I said, Jake, you know, we really should. I'm not. I'm not going to go ve- vegetarian. I said, I'm not going to ask you to do that. He's 13, you know. So I said, but let's be more thoughtful about mm-hmm. the meat we do get. Totally. Like, let's, there's this, all this factory farming. We should right. try to get every, not ever get stuff that has been factory farmed because it's just awful. And I want, and you know, he wasn't even quite ready to listen to that, even though he's a very sensitive kid. Yeah. And he does know, like, he did a document, he at school made a documentary with his friends about fast food. 
uh-huh. the industry, and he stopped eating on his own. Like he just would never wants to go to get. Well, yeah, well, that, that's like supersized me is the Bible of that. You know what right. I mean? But and and what you said, yeah, factory farming. Listen, I, I don't advocate whatever. Bodies are so unique, and and but at least have a sensitivity, as you say, almost an American Indian kind of point of view about thanking the life, right. just being aware. Yeah, one with it. And yeah, well, say thank you right. for your sacrifice mr animal you know what i mean like <laughs> right, exactly if you're gonna if i'm gonna eat mean i would at least do that have thoughtfulness about it uh-huh. not that it's just in this package sure but the factory farming thing forget that that's just you have to just watch one movie about that yeah and it's hard to in good conscience well do me, yourself a favor i mean i w- if i had known i would have brought my copy but just pick up that yeah. book because honestly after all the already the due diligence that you've done and the thought that you've given to it, this is not going to become as any shock to you, no. but it will reinforce your decision yeah. in all the best ways. So I would recommend actually picking it up, and it's a good read, and he's a very good writer, you know. So yeah, I don't know, if, not not Franz, and I, I misspoke. John, um, what the? This is one of those off days, like uh, where names are just not going to uh, come to me. Uh, I hate when that happens. It's oh man, your time Saffron then. Four, uh-huh. Jonathan Saffron okay. Four. Thanks. Do you yeah. know him? No. He's the one that wrote Everything is Illuminated, and he wrote... I don't read. I read three books No, but life. they made him into... F- Jaws, sure Ruby Fruit Jungle, and even Cowboy Girls Get the Blues. Those are the three well, books I've Well, those are the big three. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good... I don't believe that. It's, uh, it's absolutely the truth. I, no, I took a class in Orwell in 11th grade. I read okay. Keep the Aspidistras Flying, oh, I love that Farm, one. and um, I love that 1984. One. Right. So those three and really? the other three. Those are the six books I've read my whole life. How, I sort of feel I, like since I haven't started what, How Start Now, there's so many, like I could never... It's a really good attitude, but I love writing. People say, how can you write and, and yeah. not read? Because they're two completely different things. I love yeah, writing. Yeah, it doesn't mean I like to read. I suppose. Yeah, no, it's true. They are different things. But I guess a passion for words, you think, maybe? Yeah, but writing them, hearing them. Well, that goes all my questions because it's just going to ask you about all your favorite books. So that, <laughs> I will say it's I'm a guilty. Around. I'm also disle- I'm a little dyslexic, and I wasn't oh, a good reader. Are. So that didn't make me excited. Right. But I get the sort of opposite experience that most people get well, from a book. like that. I feel when I'm in a book, I'm missing the world. Like I, and, mm-hmm. and most people feel like that opens up this b- incredible yeah. world to them reading a book. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm a watcher. I'm an Aquarian. I, like to, I feel like if I'm, I'm buried in a book, I'm, not, I'm missing all this incredible world around me that I can visually see. I suppose that's an argument. Yeah, it's, no, I have no, I'm not sort of, <laughs> I have no good argument. I'm just, it's just a personal thing. Right. But I will say the few times that I've been charged with reading a book to maybe adapt it for a movie as a job or something, it's like, I love it. Well, so everything. I'm, I'm totally full of shit. Like if when I do <laughs> yeah, do I've it. read other books then. No, I haven't. Okay. But when I do do it, the few times, one or two times, yeah. I love it. So Jaws, let's talk about Jaws. Jaws, Jaws, Jaws they made into a, a really great movie. Yeah, I saw that. Even Cowgirls get through. Sorry, sorry, Ruby Gus Van Sant, but it was not a good movie at all. I don't think I saw his version. Don't of go it. see it now. And then Ruby for Jungle. So I, I guess I got made into that some. Into a, was that your lesbian face? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> it was, this was all 1978. This was like when I was <laughs> okay. a sophomore in, co- well, in high school. Let me ask you then, during that period when you were reading those books, what was that like for you if you were all of a sudden a reader? Uh, for, well, I for think it was period. on acid, right? I was taking a lot of acid and um, doing a lot of drugs. Now it's my turn not to be sure if you're joking or not. No, that's for true. Yeah, okay. no, I've, I've been okay. clean and dry for 34 years. Uh-huh. But back then I was active, radical alcoholic drug addict. Really? Oh, yeah. Since from 13 to 21. Mm-hmm. And so that was 10th so, grade. So it was all day drugs and alcohol and, and reading these uh-huh. couple books and being a hippie. And okay. I don't know why I got into it, those. And then, and then the Orwell class was as a junior in high school and uh, read those. And this one I read them, too, I yeah. think, junior high school. Yeah, so, so you... Go ahead. So I don't know that I, I felt like I was now, quote, unquote, a reader because I had read <laughs> two books. an addict in class. slash reader. Huh. Oh, you know what? One other one I read. Why did they try it? The oh, Eden Express I read by Mark Vonnegut, who's wait, Kurt who? Vonnegut's junior. The Eden Express, it was about wait, him wait, going Kurt crazy. Kurt Vonnegut's son? Yes. Oh. And it was called Mark The Eden Vonnegut. Express about him going crazy or okay. having a nervous breakdown. It was really good. Oh. Interesting. Listen, I read a little New Age. I've read, you know, yeah. Eckhart Tolle, you know, like I take your The Power word. of Now. Like, well, okay. you know, I, I like Are you reading literature. real books? That's a book. I mean, are you reading them or are you just kind of like... I, I, like we can move on. I yes, mean, I I, you're, you're reading them. I'll just take your yes, word. I, read at, them a at, I, read, at your I word, try right. to Deepak Chopra. Yeah. Uh, what's that amazing female monk when things fall apart? Um, Pema Chodron. Yeah. 
very good. Yeah. So anyway, my friends who played Scrabble with me, yeah, Pema Chodron. Yeah, she's, uh, I think, that first was the first female monk, oh. Tibetan monk. The first okay. female, something like that, the first uh-huh. Western I think I read that one. Tibetan monk okay. or something. And, and she's great. So uh, her books, you know. So these are inspirational. Yeah, and, and trying to cultivate. A certain spirituality in your yeah, life. Yeah. A cent- a centering. Yes, yes, a meditative. It's so funny because uh, it's so. Uh, that I'm terrible at. Yeah, but that's not the point, right? Well, I had a revelation after 35 years of meditating. You know, it was... Is this TM or is this... No, it's like just... I've tried uh, everything, but just really sitting and counting my breaths. And if I get to counting to 10 with 10 being the goal, and if I have a thought, I have to go back to one. And so in 35 years, I've never made it to two. Because whenever (laughs) I get to two, I go, oh my God, I made it to two. And that's a thought and I have to go back Uh, to one. So the idea is to be free of thought. And just focusing well, on Well, when only they come, let them just move on like a cloud and don't attach to them. Don't get into a story. Don't, don't run off on this, with the story of it. I um, see. Because the thing you try to bar, you're just inviting. So the idea of trying to don't have a thought is just going to invite it. Um, listen, what do I know? I, I can't even get to two. But I just had a revelation after 35 years because <laughs> I'm really good at one. Breathe in and breathe out one. <laughs> okay. I thought, what if, 10, what if 10 wasn't the goal? What if one was the goal? Uh-huh. And I just go one, one, one. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I'm, I feel I'm a, I've come up with a genius idea. Yeah. Well, you succeed every time you do the meditation. That's right. Yeah. And I can do one. So yeah. maybe that's the, the new, I mean, listen, if I do three minutes a day, five minutes a day, anything counts, you know? Sure, sure. Um, and running. We were talking about running. I feel running. Yes. I felt right. very meditative, even though yeah. I'm listening to music and yeah. stuff. Yeah, I just have to. You. I have to figure out the tendonitis thing, and because yeah, I, I'm sucks. really missing it, and it's the only thing that works that I'm really get committed to. And, I, and there was a and period. We have similar bodies. We're like Scottish well, you're stock legs. Right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Thick. The kind of thick, s- yeah, na- like naturally strong. muscular, but not. Although, yeah. uh, opposite for afraid. running. Opposite made for running. Like we don't have runner. We have like identical non-runner bodies. It's true. Bodies. Right. Not long. Like, like these sinewy. Right. Fucking right. Fucking no. Ethiopian. That's true. That's true. Right. Okay, so we're speaking with Eric Schaefer. Finally, uh, make the. Uh, <laughs> that was an excellent. <laughs> it was a good intro. You didn't know that was by the now. preamble. Yeah. But you know, I mean, truthfully, I do. I do an intro, just so you know, you understand. And for some reason, no matter where things go, it always just makes sense. You know what I mean? It always works out exactly right. So, and I'm sometimes I'm surprised. You know, you have one of these kind of weird feel. Like while you're doing the podcast, it feels like it's a little weird a little disorganized and then you listen to it it's like no this is really ends up being compelling talk you know so have you done many podcasts or no i haven't i've only done a couple and and what you just said was interesting though because that i find is actually sort of speaks to your skill as a as a as a creative person as a podcaster in the same way that i feel like when you've honed a skill often you're kind of going on fumes sometimes and you think i know i find this in filmmaking yeah yeah that you'll think, but just like you described, that you got nothing. It's all over the place, and then then it's it just doesn't. It all sort of creatively works. And I think that's not by accident. I think that's because you've honed a skill at, at what you're doing. All right, I'll I'll I'll, I'll go with that. I like that. Um. Although I don't like that, I'm smelling pot now. That's really not good. Like that. fucking smoking a big joint right there. That's really annoying. Um, Does it really bother you? Huh? Really bothers you? Yeah. Oh, because, yeah, yeah, you don't want to. Yeah. That and second. And, it looks like it's the and we're downwind. It's the, yeah. We're downwind. I'm happy to move. Can we? Sure. Yeah. Sorry, man. No, no, don't be sorry. Can we keep talking while we move? We have, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's keep talking. We're now moving because we're gonna, smelling like a big pot joint. We are in. Uh, look at this. See, these are professional runners. See, look, this lady has the perfect yeah. runner. Oh, my gosh. Body. Right. She's like 5'11. Well, that's not true, actually. She's. Yeah. Yeah, fuck All it. Right, let's go. Um, here come, and here come the cops. We could actually yeah, uh, do a citizen's arrest. Yeah. Or As if at least they care like, about pot smoking. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? They'd be like, are you kidding me? Let's go to that bench over there, can okay. we? Yeah. We could also do double Dutch, by the way, while we're... <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, no, I have to lift that, though. Yeah, I got it. Okay. We're wrangling. Because I, I heard the scraping. So anyway, so I think it's true, you know, that you... That you <laughs> now you're going to get the uh, sausage uh, fumes. Yeah, up. well, that'll... Yeah, the sausage cart... Will overpower the pot smoke. It's more this ice is cream where, right here, where I, I, I feel very bad, but I, it was a different time in the 70s. By the way, over there. And I, there was a Korean boy, the one Korean boy that lived in the neighborhood, and right there, 
at that part of Riverside Park on 100th Street. Uh-huh. I tried to convince him that this little dirt square I had made was a brownie, and he, he knew it was not a brownie. We were probably both six or seven, and, and he just didn't want to take a bite. And I, I was just, we all applied such peer pressure. Mm-hmm. It's a brownie. I, I, I guarantee you it's a chocolate brownie. And he just, he, he, he so clearly knew it was not. And finally he took a bite. It was not my finest moment at all. And we all made fun of him. It was just not good. It was awful. Kids are so fun. awful. Yeah. We're all, we all do it. I, my worst moment, I still remember, very young, and I think I took a I, I was either hit a kid or I pushed him up against something and he chipped a tooth and yeah. I, I I mean that's just so not no, me I know. even no, then not at all. I don't know why I, I would have so, clearly 50 been, years later I'm remembering it and every yeah. time I run by here I yeah. literally remember it and feel bad I want to I hope I could meet him and make an apology to him it's not gonna happen you have to forget that's yourself. why the whole bullying thing now I listen yeah. I'm all for it I'm all listen because I didn't understand in high school in, in grade school why no one was sticking up for me mm-hmm. why my parents wouldn't go to school and get someone arrested for what they were, how they were bullying me. I mean, and uh, but I will say, having said that, mm-hmm. the kind of shit and bullying that I went through as a kid, yeah. on the, being on the bullied end of things, yeah. made convincing someone to eat a, a piece of dirt brownie was nothing. You know? It's just dirt. Yeah, it was just dirt. Oh, no, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's okay. That's protein. not too bad. Okay, no, there's, there's worse. Yeah, I felt awful. Things I from felt the awful park then, and I felt brown. awful clearly for no, the no, subsequent no. half can't, a century. Can't, I don't think you can die from that or get sick. Uh, no, I just felt dirt. bad. The idea of because yeah. I've been humiliated so many times when I was kid, you? you know. And I, I, yeah. I guess I learned really young humor was just so effective. Being funny and being not the class clown, but doing impressions of the teachers, all those things really just. You know, and then it also kind of kept. It became a device over many years of, of course, breaking the ice socially and feeling comfortable. But it became part of, like the way I would also I could distance myself on a certain level also. So then I went through this rejection of it, trying not to kind of be more serious, and then just said, "What do I care?" You know, like come full circle in a way and realize that's just part of who I am. You know, yeah, I've just it, always been super to, sensitive. Like, you know, people, I have a yeah. lot of friends that are like, hey, let it roll off your back. And I, I'm just a, always been a super sensitive like kid that. and person. I like, I like that. I like you already. Listen, when you write, direct, act, and produce movies, yeah. you know, it's, uh, you know, you're really out front and center, That's obviously. Right. Yeah. You know and so I mean? you're going to be a target. On yeah. Some and, level. and there's going to be, it's art. It's an artistic endeavor. So right. people are going to either, and, and I make stuff that's very, uh, I don't know. Has a r- real points of view about stuff, and it's and imp- as dangerous as some, and, yeah. and and liberating to others. And so, you know, I guess I, I I'm not saying I w- wouldn't want it any other way. I don't look at it objectively. I just I look at it subject in, intensely subjectively. I just mm-hmm. do what uh, feels like a story I want to tell. And I know that I'm just an average person. Mm-hmm. So I know there's going to be millions of other average people that identify, right. and. I, that's how I operate. So there's no sense of it's very myopic in that respect in terms of what I choose to do. So, but I'm smart enough to understand that there are plenty of people that then are going to feel threatened or just not like it, not think it's funny, not think it's smart, not think it's interesting. Uh, and you know, and 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 with social media and the way that you know people get their information now and how many mm-hmm. people can get inf- their points of view and opinions out there into the world there are a lot of points of view and opinions now about everything including Every, right, including art there. whereas before yeah. in the years past it was harder to get your art out and har- harder to get opinions about that art out yeah and so people can determine whether you know there's good and there's not so good in in that paradigm and you're trajectory as a filmmaker really has been over that course of that time of where totally i mean yeah, it's all I been st- through and in fact i mean in some ways you know the the speed of not only just the, the advent of social media but also just how quickly film distribution has been evolving all these things it's, it's like sped up so and you've been making film and to some degree taking uh, advantage also of certain techno certain certain parts of the evolution for instance you know doing the reality tv show i like to call it a documentary Reali- series documentary series okay yes. I, it and, doesn't and matter i'm, not, I'm just being I'm, I'm joking because i i watch it was so almost <laughs> almost really, solely yeah. reality tv on television yeah but that, honestly but okay. but in the old days it's so funny because we would have called it a documentary series if, if you follow a guy sure. doing whatever a woman doing mm-hmm. anything following running around the country 
we would have called that a docu series. Anyway, I'm kidding you. Yes, reality I think documentary. Whatever Kardashians you want to call it. changed all that, or maybe we, it was Big Brother. I don't know, but you know, yeah. it all. But that was. I mean, I don't know if you're listening and you have not seen the series. Uh, I can't believe I'm still single, but very addictive, very entertaining stuff. Thanks. Yeah, you know that that. I'm always amazed at who has even seen my stuff, mm-hmm. let alone who might like it. And and it's always fun that that series. So many, I guess there are a lot of people that hang out, you know, like me, like that's what I mean. That watching Showtime, it happened to be on at eleven or eleven thirty or midnight at, when it was it on. Was, I was able to binge watch that much. I know, so I don't. Well, remember. yeah, then it was also came on like on demand. It must stuff, have been but, on demand because I just kept couldn't right. stop. I kept going. So whoever, you, but I've run into the most interesting people. From Mike DeLuca to Jeffrey Tambor that were like, you know what I love to hear? So I'm like, what? They're like, <laughs> yeah. that show where you're like going cross country? And I said, really? On so that book I, tour. I feel good about it. Yeah. Well, because again, it's just it's just a dude out there, a human being, being a human being. And I, and, and, uh, I had a lot of fun with that series. And I think that uh, it's, again, that, you know, that was series that was in 2008, 9, and 10, mm-hmm. which th- isn't that long ago. But... So much is, has changed with streaming and with, inter- oh, with yeah. social media in the last seven years, just yeah. in 2010. Right. That if that were on now, I think a, a whole lot more people would have seen it. It's never too late to pick it up. But yeah, it was on Hulu for a while, too. And then they just, oh, they just discontinued so, okay. it along with a lot of stuff. They sort of, yeah. because there's so much content coming out, they can't keep stuff right. on there for that long. Uh, and I guess, yeah, that's a whole other conversation. I mean, just in terms of the sheer, like how you get your stuff to be noticed amongst amidst rather so much else but that's not really the point of this conversation so i only wrote down because i i realized that it had been a while i seen a number of your films as they've come out you know and uh, back when people went actually to the movie theater to that watch a movie. that uh, certainly but also just you know or just this that it came out some of them i'm sure i saw Either oh, yeah. on cable or right. you know on DVD or then streamed. I don't know. But when I started to look back at some of the films and looked at the like the cast, I was like, first of all, I do remember mm-hmm. my life's in yes. turnaround at a time when I kind of was becoming an adult, forming my own opinions about film. Right as your career was, you know, you just started with that film, and and that was during that period when. There was a new generation of filmmakers making indie film, and obviously, all of a sudden, all these, all the majors had these, you know, indie film houses, right? right you know, and you were part of that um, whole movement of filmmakers. So that was like one of those films I saw because everybody was talking about that one, yeah. and you know, and we mentioned Tom DeCillo on the way yes, down right. here, who's been on here a couple of times. So there was, you know, his films and all the, you know, Hartley and yeah, it was the early to mid nineties. Uh, it was, yeah. you know, and. And a big sort of godfather of getting a lot of those films out was um, John Pearson, you know, right. who who helped fund it at, with his company, you know, working sure. at Islet. A lot of he gave us finishing money for that movie along right. with Clerks, She's Got to Have It, Brothers, Mac, not I don't yeah, know, yeah. Brothers McMullen, Go Fish, you know, like sure. right. all these sort of seminal. You can read his book about yeah. this whole thing. And right. he mentions in that book, actually, right, uh, Spike Dyke. Di- uh, right, Spike Dyke Dykes and whatever yeah. it's called. Yeah, uh, he mentions he does talk about it, and he says that he had kind of promised he would not be he wouldn't didn't want to take on a film about movie about movie about making a movie. You know, do you remember that? And yet he he still did it, and he was glad right. he did. Yeah, yeah. Donnie really spent a lot of time talking to John more than I did, just because I don't I don't forget why. And 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 John really liked it, but was hesitant, and then finally pulled yeah. the trigger, which we're really I'm mean, obviously I'm eternally grateful for. Um, you know, we were, I think, one of the first sort of mo- movies about making a movie that that uh, that got out there. And, Absolutely. And people right. seem to, you know, because I think it's, you know, it's more about friendship and these two guys and dreams coming true and sure. setting out in your 20s to try to make your dreams come true. The backdrop was that we were making a film um, to do that. Right. But, but, but I think the heart of the film really was, you know, sort of an eternal bromance story of going after your dreams in your 20s. So Mm -hmm. I think that appealed to a lot of people Mm -hmm. more so than it didn't feel like you had to be sort of on the in of filmmaking or know about films to like it. Yeah. So uh, coming, so how how did you just to start it off, how did, how did you think you could make a film? Well, you know, it's funny. So I, I was, uh, I drove a cab for 10 years, eight years. I was driving a taxi 
Um, I I was writing like a yellow cab. Yeah, like a, a yellow cab for eight years full time, not weekends. I mean, you it was were, like I was right. I was driving for still, fifty wait, hours you, a week. Had you? I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, Eric. I apologize. One of my. No, no. But did you? Were you still uh, an addict at that time? Or no, I got sober okay. um, when I was a junior in college. Okay. So I got at I Bard. Got, yeah, Bard. The last place I went there too. The last place you. Can, it's easy to get sober there. I mean, it's not. So yeah, bad. well, yeah. I you know, I just was lucky enough to to stop drinking and drugging my junior year of of college, and I've been lucky enough to stay sober since. And um, we overlapped. I, I bet. When were you there? Yeah, uh, eighty two, eighty. You left in eighty two. Uh, well, I was. I, I'm. A, I guess two years younger. Oh, so and so, so I graduated in eighty four. Yeah, so uh, so you were there in eighty. So we were there Amazing. the same. Amazing. Living in. Oh my god. Annadale and Hudson the same Amazing. time. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, I was living in Tivoli. Um, yeah. Which, yeah. So sorry. So you know, I, was, I drove the cab for eight years, and I, I was I was like a like a heat seeking missile and wanting to make films, you know. But but back in the eighties, it was like this big spec script boom. So it was all about write a spec script, and you can sell it for a million dollars, and you right. can make them. And I figured that was the way I had most control as a writer. As an actor or director, you need someone to give you a job. But I felt like writing, I could do. Right. I could write the script and then uh-huh. try to find money to go make the film. So for eight years, I would write. I would drive for fifty hours a week and write for fifty hours a week. Um, so I would, and and I wrote twenty scripts, a book, which I didn't sell, but became Wiry Spindell, a film that I made ten yeah, years later after I couldn't sell the book, and couldn't get arrested. And I was driving the cab, and I was just heartbroken because I so badly wanted to make a film, but I didn't know how to connect the dots, you mm-hmm. know, and I didn't. Just personality-wise, I wasn't the kind of person that wanted to work my way up on, on a film set. Just for my, per- I, I wanted to step foot on a film set when I was a writer, director, star, producer. Did you have any role models for that? Had you seen anybody do that? I mean, I guess. What, well, who I was guess around? just Woody Allen, you know, what, to Woody, me, had, I guess, I guess you so. know, had ri- was a writer, director, John sales. Know, yeah, a few people knocking around Cassavetes, right. but even that, right? He did was doing. Such no, a I different. really just knew that's what I wanted to do. Right. Um, just because I liked all those things. I liked to act. I liked to write it. Uh-huh. I liked, wanted to direct it. I just had a complete vision for it. Right. So then I was, uh, I was turning 30. I was heartbroken. I was disillusioned. I'd worked my ass off. Couldn't get close. And then this movie called Laws of Gravity came out, which was made by Nick Gomez and these guys at the shooting gallery. And it was like a $40,000 movie to begin with, and they got finishing funds at no movie that's on film back then was ever could only be forty thousand to blow it up from sixteen millimeter cost more than that. So okay, you know. But anyway, it yeah. came out. It was at the Waverly. I was like, I knew those guys. I said, well, if they now can, the IFC Center. If they can do that, I can scrounge together a couple thousand dollars. So I moved home with my mother at thirty. I saved money, ran it to Donnie Ward, an old friend of mine. He was feeling the same way. We. We got together. We sat in the Broadway diner on 101st Street and Broadway with a yellow legal pad and started writing the script. Martha Plimpton walked in because she lived in the neighborhood. I walked up to her and said, will you be in this movie where we're writing over in that booth? She said, sure. Had you ever met her before? No. No, that was the, okay. no I just <laughs> walked up to her. Then I picked up Phoebe Cates in my cab and uh, asked her to be in it. And she said, basically, sure. And so then Donnie... Donnie's great grandfather, great uncle, was Ring Lardner, or Ring Lardner Senior, or Junior. I, I get it mixed up. Is that true? Yeah. yeah well, the 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 pinko one. I, I forget the, uh, well, the Ring famous Lardner, amazing the writer who wrote Mash and all yeah. Of, yeah. yeah. And so He's John Sales had played him in Eight Men Out. Oh. So okay. Donnie <clears throat> approached. We wrote. Donnie wrote John Sales saying, "Hey, this is incredible, totally cool. You played my great my grandfather, uncle. I'm sorry, I forget which it is." Oh, right. And, and John Sales was like, "That's great. Sure, I'll be in your movie." So we had, <laughs> so we scrounged together like seventeen thousand dollars from mm-hmm. friends and family, and me moving home and saving my money from the cab. And so we had enough to to shoot this film. And the first scene we ever shot was the John Sales scene. Uh, where he plays this smarmy producer, right. and uh, the rest is history. And uh, so, so I, I just knew we could make it because I knew, yeah. uh, even though I'd never set foot on a f- on a film set, I had acted a lot. I had written a lot of plays. Sure. I, yeah, I understand. In my mind, you had a vision. Yeah. I understand. Yeah, it's like thirty years of building, of a great creating a story in your head and a method of storytelling. Yeah, and I had a, your a own clear vision in my head. Yeah, just, and as we like say in the movie, you just hire some somebody to hold the else camera, to point the camera. And yeah, stuff. exactly. Yeah. So, so what were you thinking as you stood there behind that guy pointing the camera? 
And there's well, John Sayles. Well, it wasn't. Sayles. I was in, acting in the scene. Oh, so right. We, of course. So, was, so what were you thinking sitting across from John Sayles? I, I just, well, just we cried. I mean, I pulled up. I'll never forget it. We were driving Donnie's, like, beat-up Dodge Omni. And it, we shot it at J.G. Mellon's on 74th or 5th in Amsterdam, uh-huh. uh, that bar. It's because he knew people so that somehow they let us shoot there. So it was 5 in the morning, earlier than I'd ever gotten Nobody up. Nobody said no to you. I was up from Coke binges, you know, but I was sober at that point. Five in the morning with a bagel, juggling a bagel and a coffee, and, and we rounded the corner, and there was already a little tiny truck with people, like, taking film equipment off it, like shiny brass stands. I didn't even right. know what they were for, but I'd seen them yeah. on film sets. And I was so shocked. I was like, how did they know to get here before us and start setting up? And Donnie's like, I don't know. The, the producer we got is like, does all that. Or maybe Donnie did know. I'm, I'm, I didn't know. Uh, yeah. And I just remember having chills that this was the most exciting thing that had ever happened to me. And it was just the, exactly right. You were in the right place. And you're, there was no better or more perfect place for you to be in the world right Oh, my then. God. Are you kidding? Right? It, was, it, yeah. was, it was nirvana. It was incredible. Yeah, right. And we walked in. And John Sayles shot the first scene. He sort of probably helped half us direct it. Help, oh half God. helped us direct it, sort <laughs> of. And, and yeah. we're sitting there. And it was just, I, I'll never forget it. It was because it was also this culmination of a dream that I had worked so hard for 10 fucking years yeah. driving that cab and not getting anything. And then finally we sort of made it happen again with the help of a lot of people. So it was kind of like Manifest Destiny. I mean, in a respect, it felt like it was always meant to be and that I knew it would always happen, mm-hmm. but it also felt like a dream come true. And that's how the, my whole life has felt. I've always felt and expected it to happen, but that hasn't meant that it has felt any less miraculous when it has. So it's that weird kind of both things operating at the same time. Mm. And a sense that a fear that it will never, ever happen again every time I don't have a job, which is a lot of the time. Right, which I guess is a, a very common experience. And then you have to have that voice, I hope, that knows better. And sure yeah, like says, blinders. You have you've to gone just, through this before and go well, right. I think I read a thing yeah. like that people that have made a million dollars before uh-huh. have a, a billion time, a thousand times percentage higher chance of if they lose it to make another million, then, then someone who's never, never made, made it. Yes, because right. they just have a sense that they've done it. Right, and it's achievable. And that it, there's abundance in the world yeah. instead of a sense of lack. And, and <laughs> I've been so. lucky enough to make a million, but, and I've, I've lost it. Well, I don't lose it. I sink it all in. The, I never save anything. I understand. It. You turn it I put it into a movie true. because the one thing we talked about was the one thing in the 80s and 90s that you had to shoot on 35 millimeter. You could make a film on 60 millimeter to kind of get yeah. on like we do. Dort. That yes, yeah, that like it. my life's in turnaround. But then once you did that, mm-hmm. then you'd want to shoot on thirty-five millimeter, and, and really you could, that oh, right. you couldn't do for less than three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars. Right. Well, fortunately, I guess your next, the next one, if right, was if Lucy, if Lucy fell. Yeah. So then I don't know why she's ignoring me. Yeah, she's, my life's in turnaround, and that sort of it was luckily, three and a half million. Got, what? That was the three and a half. I, I don't normally talk numbers, but yeah, yeah. I'm well, just trying may- to point. I don't normally get stuck on those types of budgets and stuff, but I, I think it's very. It is an interesting and exciting that you go from. What did you say? Forty thousand. Yeah. Well, we put to, it in the can for forty thousand, and then John gave us finishing money, so it was two hundred thousand so total. Totally. Th- you could blow yes. it up and all that. And but then, it was like, yeah, you know, come on. It was, and, and so but to then, go from that just to show the contrast yeah. it, it, to, to three and a half million. No, it felt like for, David Lean money. It right. felt like yeah. literally we had. I had. Three and a half million for if Lucy fell, but two point two below the line. So the one point five went to like so, CAA so packaging fees. What's and below the line. Below the line means basically for the nuts and bolts to actually make your film, to hire actors, to hire crew members, to hire the trucks, to hire to rent the camera. That's all the nuts and bolts of making your film. Before, before you turn on the camera, all that stuff that's well, no, all even, set even up. no, no, even when you turn on the camera, yeah, okay. all production mm-hmm. above the line is what you pay the producer. I see the actors. But you pay the salaries, and CAA took a packaging fee of like five hundred thousand dollars just to put it all together. Oh, I see. So they were all CAA actors. Yes, so I was with CAA at that point. Right, right, right. So right, right, was right, right. makes sense. Um, ben Stiller. So was Sarah right. Jessica Parker. Sarah Jessica Parker was um, in it. And yeah. then you know I gave Scarlett Johansson her first or second movie role as a ten year old. I've still I'm still waiting to make that call. I have not called her. I yeah. bumped in her, but I'm waiting till I have really the perfect movie for her because I feel like that only might be one call. Oh, where you're going to say, you, you're hey, coming Scarlett. back. Yeah. Remember now, me? Yeah. It's payback time, baby. It's not paid. Like, listen, she's, <laughs> okay, you know, you I did nothing for her, and she I was understand. amazing. She would have made it film. no matter what. Yes. Is that but, kind of thing? But, but, say, but hey, she Scarlett. was also back. You also did, she was in a second film? Yes, yeah, she had a little, a a little, little part role in fall. fall. Right. And uh, she okay. was 
you know, you Did could you tell see she it? was special. Really? Okay. Because when I, I mean, oh, I no, didn't, I don't remember, even though I She's... saw those, I don't remember her until, of course, Ghost World. Yeah. But I, I you know, I, know, I have she to go was, back. You could tell she back. was special, you yeah. know, for sure. Uh, people always said that about me. I don't know what yeah. that, <laughs> they meant something else, perhaps. Oh, and, you know, and Bill Sage, who's a friend, was in that, of course. Uh, He's great. Well, yeah, I, you, I, you I must say I've been lucky. You stable in that film, too. Well, I've been, it is kind of, you know, I've been lucky, or I guess I've been lucky that, Great actors have walked in front of me, and I've been lucky enough to recognize or think they're really great mm-hmm. when they're earlier in their careers. Yeah. You know, from you know, the last Emmys Award show, like five of my sort of Eric alumni, Sterling Brown was in uh-huh. Starved. Uh-huh. He's the amazing actor who's gone on to win Emmys for This Is Us and I think the, the OJ FX show. and. Mm-hmm. You know, Scarlet, obviously, and, and uh, Liz Reeser, Elizabeth Reeser was in Mind the Gap, and mm-hmm. she's gone on to do amazing things. But these are just amazing actors that happen to walk in, and I happen to get lucky and cast them when they were earlier in their careers. But how did you feel? So, well, I guess you had worked with Phoebe Cates, as you mentioned, uh, and, and Martha uh, Plimpton, a couple of other, and, and John. So maybe by the time you got to If Lucy Fell, you weren't too intimidated uh, by the idea of Ben Stiller and uh, well, you know was, directing, well, I had picked up Sam Jessica. Very, very, well, listen, yeah, we made we made my license turn around, and then we 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 got CAA. It came out. We got a good New York Times review. Kind of people, it was buzzy. We right. people heard about it, and 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 then we went to CAA, and we had Donnie and I had written another script, and we kind of like got it set up at TriStar with these big producers, and we wanted to, of course, be in it, write it, and direct it. And they said, we won't let you be in it, but we'll let you direct it. And they said, so we cast Ben Stiller. That's how we met Ben. Mm-hmm. And the, Mark Canton, the head of TriStar, said, if you cast any of the Baldwins in the other role, it's a greenlit movie. Any of them. Billy, Alec. Is it? Didn't matter. Even one that's not, <laughs> that doesn't exist. And Donnie kind of knew them from Long Island. And, and Billy said no. And, like, uh, Alec sort of wasn't, uh, he was off doing bigger things. And, and then... Um, the other one said no, and uh, Stephen said no, right. and what's the big one that's crazy? I don't, I don't know. know. That describes a few of them yeah. actually. But, but so we sorry. we were on the like one yard line. We had a budget, ten million dollar budget. We were going to be able to direct it. It was mm-hmm. about to be greenlit, and then it didn't happen. It fell apart, and I realized, oh, that's what happens. And I could choose to. If I'm lucky, probably have a very lucrative career writing stuff, getting put on projects, but never make another movie. Mm-hmm. And I just spent 10 years in the fucking cab, and we made my life to turn around. I'm not going to let... I don't want to do that. Yeah. I'd rather do it on... I'd rather go make another $15,000 movie. Sure. Just, so I said, I'm making If Lucy Fell. And so I, I had written If Lucy Fell. I met... Okay. So before I made my life to turn around... I had had one stint in Hollywood with an agent I got who had introduced me. I had two meetings, and one of them was Molly Ringwald. And I had been up for Ducky as an actor. Oh. The lead in that, but didn't get it. So, and of course, like everyone, I was in love with Molly Ringwald. Yeah, and, sure. and I had almost got Ducky in Pretty in Pink as an actor. Because Betty Buckley, who I knew, had like knew Howie Deutsch, who directed it, and got me an audition when I didn't have an agent. But then I got an agent. Before I made my lesson turn, I was a cab driver, but I had, I, I had one, two meetings. One was Molly Ringwald. Long story short, I went because I didn't. I looked pasty, and I wanted to have a nice suntan to meet Molly. So I got my sun, my baby oil, and went to Malibu for two hours. Put it all over my face, except for my nose and my mouth. I put on sunblock. And I showed up in, for my Molly meeting with a beet red lobster face <laughs> and a white yeah. nose and a white ring around my this mouth. This came back, right? This I did that in Lucy Fell. Lucy Fell, right. Yeah, Lucy yeah. Fell. That's what I, I, now I'm remembering Yeah, it. so yeah. Molly laughed, ha, 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 but I felt she liked me, and I asked her out, and she said yes, and we started dating. I wrote if Lucy Fell for her. We ended up not being able to set it up for her. I went back to the cab, made my life and turn around. The story I just told you happened where we, uh-huh. we almost made another movie but didn't. And I said, I want to make If Lucy Fell. So at that point, I had picked up Sarah Jessica Parker in my cab years earlier. Met her at a party. We had the same agent now at CAA. I said, 
don't know if you remember me, but I picked you up an 86 in Columbus and took you to 22nd. And she's like, yeah, that makes sense. I used to go to a little coffee right. shop there. Yeah. I sent <laughs> it to her. She said, yes, she'd do it. We had met Ben Stiller because of the movie that fell apart. Um, so CAA packaged it. I cast mm-hmm. L. And, at, you know, those were the days where CAA could just go, yeah, we'll get you three million bucks to make it. Yeah. Right. By tomorrow. They did. And I made a, and I made a Felicity Fell. But again, it was like... Just the film, 35 millimeter, is so thick and fat and luxurious, and it really felt yeah. like you were a real filmmaker, right? Because you had this thick film, yeah, right? 60 millimeter was this it's, thin, uh, independent film, you know, yeah, not a, right. in a bad it's way, but you just rep- felt like it does represent, right? Oh God, it was uh, so, so much. It's incredible, yeah. And Interesting. So, I never thought about it. That and way. you had, and I had movie trucks like you see, yeah. on the street with right. trailers, trailers for the stars. Not and many, but there did were you like, have a trailer for the first time? I, we didn't have the budget, and I didn't. I would never be in it because I was writing, directing, producing it. So. Well, you still okay? I'm sure you've had a trailer. No, we didn't because I was like, I don't need one. one. And I came from the oh. world of independent filmmaking, which is like, I don't For want film. money. But that's another thing. wasteful money. Right, I don't right, want right. to spend wasteful money. Yeah, well, that's another thing that's changed a lot because you say you came from independent film, but you made well, you you've gone back and forth. Yeah, uh, truthfully, right. Because even well, if no, you that's made the biggest it, budget film I ever made, well, uh, the TV yeah. shows I've made have been bigger budget. Right, that's true. I right. mean, like Starved and Gravity, we had which you were consi- good. Still had relatively no money next to what they make real, you know, big budget TV shows for. But you know, we had budget of six hundred thousand for a half hour episode, and we did ten of them. Mm-hmm. So I had six million to do basically ten half hours for a five hour movie. So yeah. yeah, but but in New York City again, that's. N- that's nothing. So that was speed filmmaking. I mean, we would shoot a 25-minute episode in two and a half days. Right. I mean, it was literally racing around. And you were doing that, though, in... No, it was all here. It was here? It was all here. here, yeah. Okay. I, I didn't, that's, that's a hole in my um, Oh. My, my no, knowledge about you, because I haven't had a chance to see those series. Oh, really? Starved? You never saw her? Gravity? I didn't. They're good. I'll send, I mean, if you're interested, I'll send. Yeah, I am interested. I want to see Starved, that. it was Sterling Brown was in and Laura Benanti. And, right, you mentioned. Uh, really cool, dark, edgy yeah, half see. hour about people with eating disorders. That was on FX. Yeah. So, the, and, okay, so, well, since you brought it up, because, uh, you know, we started talking about food and eating and all, yeah. and it, <laughs> it's, of course, a, um, a through line, if you will, that goes through uh, almost everything you've written. Yeah. Right? So uh, you're very open and honest about it, right? Yeah. I mean, the, Struggles with food. Yeah. food. And is, now I have to ask you, is, do you really, just for my own uh, information, I have to know, do you, were, are you night, eat, night snack eater? Yeah, or I'm cake? a night eater. Night yeah, cake. I'm a night eater. Night call. cake. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a night eater. I, you know, I've gotten much better at that over the last four or five I years. Just, a lot of people go through. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, luckily, listen, eating disorders are brutal, and my heart goes, you know, I have... I have experience with alcohol and drug addiction, but like food, I mean, alcohol and drugs, you don't need any of that to live, to survive. You can just cut it out of your life. Oh, right. But food, Not you so mu- much. you need sustenance, right? So like the agent of your addiction is something that you must have to survive. Yeah. It's off. It's, it's, it's brutal. So luckily I'm not bulimic or anorexic, um, completely sort of definitively, mm-hmm. but I have a disordered relationship to eating. I, I think like most people mm-hmm. that don't rise to the level of bulimia or, or anorexia where it gets life-threatening. Mm-hmm. But I'm obsessed with my weight, obsessed with, you know, counting calories, counting fat points, robbing Peter to pay Paul. If I don't eat throughout the day, then I'll, but then I set myself up to binge. So like all that kind of stuff that I think, I don't know what percentage, 90, I feel like 90% of us do. Yeah. But all that would be fine if, if you didn't feel guilty. I don't feel guilty. No, I don't feel oh, guilty. You don't feel no, guilty. No, no, no. I just. So what's the problem? The problem is that I don't feel healthy. Mm-hmm. I don't. I want to feel healthy, and I can't. You know, and I so I I, I boomerang or okay. whatever you call it, but between like thirty and forty pounds. Really? Yeah. And so, but I've gotten. Listen, the last five or six Me years, too, actually, I've gotten a lot know. of health around it. Um, I've gotten much better. Mm-hmm. Um, Weight Watchers has really helped me. Really. And um, and so the night eating, I've kind of don't do anymore. Uh huh. For the last four or five years. Uh, um, yeah, Weight Watchers has been amazing huh. because I like numbers yeah. I, and I like oh, discipline. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's all about the numbers. It's all so about it's just sort of like track of numbers. Yeah. That's it. And, you, and I can eat Sex whatever I want in terms of kinds of foods. Mm-hmm. I just have to eat They're not portion about, control. Right. They're not about denying yourself. No, it's just a matter. that's the, yeah. always right. been the. Yes, as an addict, obviously. Yeah. If I'm saying, no, you can't have that, I'm just going to, that's all I'm going to want. Yeah. 
So, but yeah, it's been a constant struggle. But I, as I say, the last five or six years, I've had a lot of health around it, a mm-hmm. lot of recovery around eating more normally. And That's more a lot of years to to go through. That sounds like decades of, yeah. of a struggle regardless, Absolutely. right? Which is yeah. like stays with you for, yeah, you know, can stay with you quite a while maybe you can you yeah can well let it's go. still it's a daily it's yeah. a d- but it's just come up so much in your in the in the films it's not even that it's come up but it's like your choice to put it out there well because i just put out what's in my life i just put out what's true to me right again uh, feeling yeah. like i'm just a normal average run-of-the-mill human being uh-huh. and i and and so i feel like people will a, relate yeah okay yeah and especially as a, as a man i think that's the press for eating issues is way more in the feminine camp, sure, you know, absolutely. When I think, again, being just a normal run-of-the-mill guy, yeah. All the things I, that's why I like to, you know, emo- having being in touch with certain emotions and being, uh, you know, my life's in turnaround. You know, giggling about and and op- opining and being obsessed with the answering machine message that I'm waiting for for a girl to call. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of women are like, oh, my God, guys do that? And it's like, of course we do. You know, so yeah, right. sort of the things that are obvious to us as men, knowing that are obvious to me and us as men that don't get a lot of press, I, I think that's something I like to write about mm-hmm. because I feel like where there's sort of um, secrecy, there's uh, danger for people. I feel like if the one service I can I can bring to the world is illuminating uh What's natural about our condition, mm-hmm. uh, that would be a great service. Uh, I don't know if I can, but people have reported that through their identification with some of my habits, they feel m- sort of like, wow, I thought I was a freak, basically, for either sexually, right. emotionally, right. mentally having these thoughts and feelings. And I feel like I'm not because you've expressed the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So. And then, you know, and then, of course, the other subject being sex. But I guess uh, I guess I'm wondering if uh, so that, too, it's is it liberating just to put it out there and then just sort of uh, just grapple you know, with it and, and just, you know, like uh, a kind of almost aggressively take on these subjects in, in public in a public way. Does it, is it liberating? And then uh, it's well, like living transparent. I assume that's also another big part of your well what's liberating about it isn't taking like sort of again objectively like I don't think wow I'm going to take on a subject like it's not an objective sort of intention it's just you it's just being it's a story I I sit down I go what story do I want to write and it's so subjective because I don't think about what anyone else will like Mm -hmm. what will work in the marketplace I think Robert Altman once said all he can do is trust his art and hope that from time to time it matches up with popular opinion right but if who knows yeah. If, if what you do is going to work in the marketplace. So I just sit down and go, what's important to me to write as a story that I want to just write right now? Mm-hmm. And I write it. And I think sort of almost retrospectively, it seems. So what's liberating is when is watching it in the back with an audience and have feeling them identify mm-hmm. through laughter, through if they get upset. You know, not in a bad way, but in a way, in any way. They're just feel, feeling. Yes. Whether, I mean, feelings are... Having, Right. No matter That's what's liberating right. because then I feel again like I just yeah. know that I've felt so disenfranchised, so separated, so like I'm a fucking freak and like I'm unloved, unlovable, that whenever I can feel like a, a, a kinship with another human being, mm-hmm. that's so healing to me and not feel like I'm awful. And so I feel like other people must feel like that, too. Like right. it'd be nice to yeah. feel like we're not a freak. And so that's what's liberating, but but I never look at it objectively. When I look at it objectively, that's when I get scared off because then I'm letting other people's opinions. Yeah, and the people that's terrifying for any artist trying to be a truth teller. Yeah, because and the people that don't look at it the way I do Mm -hmm. and get threatened by it or don't like it, and then they sort of have their opinion, and that'll make me think, oh my god, I'm 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 barking up the wrong tree, or it's yeah, so. So yeah, have you really enjoyed festivals and opening weekends because you're you're doing the Q and A's and you're meeting yeah. the audiences yeah. and you're having yeah. really yeah that's the best part of it for me. I mean that's the only reason I do it right because I don't want to in a vacuum. I right. go I go hang around the back not in any kind of like egocentric or like narcissistic way to watch the film a thousand times. Uh-huh. I do it so I can commune commune and have the experience with the audience that's watching it mm-hmm. with a uh, hundred people, fifty people, four people yeah. in the dark in a big in a movie theater right. It's right. no secret. Yeah, I mean, it makes total sense that considering the 
that you are putting yourself out there, you know, in, in the uh, pretty brave way, you know, that you'd want to connect afterwards with people's yeah, well, experience, want, whether it's positive or negative. You know, well, hopefully positive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it's like I don't think of it. Um, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think of it as brave or not. I just think of it as kind of like gratifying. Yeah, well, it's just what I do. It's, and I don't see. I'm not ashamed. I'm so unashamed of of the things that I. I'm, I'm ashamed and have regret for a certain way I've I've behaved. I've certainly learned a lot and acted in a lot of dumb ways a lot of the time. But I'm not ashamed for my 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 sort of feelings that I know don't harm anyone else. Yeah. Or my thoughts. Again, emotionally, mentally, sexually. I'd love, to give, it, I'd love I, to give a great example of what you're talking about. Of what, what you did recently on yeah. in the uh, this web series that you you did called. Uh, Eric Schaefer, life coach, is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I only w- only discovered oddly enough because I'm pretty connected. But I only found when I we when I started to try to every periodically I'd say I gotta get Eric Schaefer on this podcast. I gotta get him. And I I think I tried around where boy meets girl, and then uh, you know I think I mentioned, and it, for whatever reason it didn't happen. But um, and then I went recently in the last few months I started to try to catch up again, thinking you know knowing that we we're gonna sit I guess and. Um, I watched this. Uh, I didn't know about it, but hmm. I found it. And there's this one long-winded way of saying there was one. Uh, there's a, this thing, this setup, which is this chair you sit in at the beginning of the day where, you know, you pleasure yourself. And <laughs> <laughs> But what's interesting is later on, I don't remember which episode. It was some, some episodes later. You're at the table and your dad Skypes you. Yeah. And you really connect with him. And it kind of comes out of nowhere. It, it comes as a surprise. And then you're like, you know, it's obviously <laughs> it's not really the t- time, but you're very moved, and because uh, you didn't expect it, so you know, it, it's just there's a nice moment where you know masturbation is now out of the question, right. but it's like for all the right reasons. I mean, it was just I, this is my way of numbing my. I mean, because a lot of people, uh, let's say, uh, what is it, serial masturbators or sex addiction. Where it's, yeah. it's it's so much p- part of your pr- preoccupation that it's often used to like any other thing we've been talking sure. about as a way of numbing or right. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that I. I'm I don't not think you did. I don't that, think you're saying seems... this. I don't think that that character in Life Coach is okay. a serial masturbator. Oh, I don't no, know no, about no. you. Once a day is. I, I okay. feel like it's probably okay. like pretty <laughs> normal for the American male. <laughs> Maybe you're right. I I, I don't know. <laughs> no, if that's think, serial masturbation, then yes, I'm a proud member. But I think <laughs> once I, a day. I should feels correct like, myself somehow. But I hear it. I know. Yes, I understand what you're saying. But were, okay, you know what it was that kind of maybe is the way I mis mis sort of uh, interpreted is because it was such a routine. It was such a yes. a, a no, setup as a ritual. You. I know exactly what you're saying. There's which a ritual that? that you created, which is a little bit you yes. know not necessarily yeah. typical, yes. but so no, and there was a ju- it was a, it's also a bit in a yeah. way, and and so so uh, so that was just a nice moment, you know, where you had well, this, thank you. you really like connected with your dad or and, the actor and, who plays. The and dad. you're right. I mean, there's been times, of course, whether it's eating or yes. sex, whether it's sure. wanting sex with another with a partner or masturbation, that it can be used as a as a deterrent to feeling what you're feeling. Yeah. Sometimes I think that's fine, <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> yeah. I, it it might be more useful to me emotionally in my sp- sort of emotional evolution. To experience what I'm experiencing, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, and not eat the cake, the right. full cake, not go have some sexual encounter with somebody else or with myself that's going to sort of get me away from feeling what I'm feeling. I think again that awful word moderation. You know, it's like sometimes I think it's completely fine. I want to go. I just need a break. I mm-hmm. want to eat a piece, a couple pieces of cake. But when it makes me sick or when right. it makes me completely so not look at my feelings that are behind it, then that's not helpful. Right. Just for the record, I'm not a serial serial man. No, you, 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 you admitted. Are, none of us I are. always say it because, well, you know, I'm, I have a child, and and once I'm I'm <laughs> running around and I'm in the parental because I don't live with him all the time, but there are sometimes weeks, and then and then okay, when I'm not living with him because I'm you know he's technically with his mother, but his mother's an actress who's on the stage, and there are sometimes I may have him for an extended period of time. And I don't like mixing that co- part of the conversation with my masturbation. Yeah, no, no. But there is a there is there is a separation. But so when I found myself like alone for periods of time, all of a sudden there is a, a little bit more motivation to catch up. That's all. That's that's. Yeah, no. You know, listen, I totally understand your point, all. and you're and you're right. It's like that, we, that it's really been a long time, and you know it's so nice to listen. To, there was uh, one time, and I remember I, I was in <laughs> L.A. I would watch the Super Bowl with a couple friends, and I was very lonely. And I remember saying to my friend. I am going to go home and eat a lot of cake by myself tonight. 
because I'm so sad. She said, why? I said, because I'm really sad and lonely. She said, why don't you just cry? I said, you know what? Oh. That's a good idea. I'm going to try that. And I went home, had a good cry, and didn't eat really? the cake. And so that's the obvious oh. didn't even good version. Maybe I should be crying. Yeah, well, and so obviously there are times that I've acted out yeah. sexually that out of loneliness that it didn't serve me. You know, um, so that right. I know that's what you're talking about. So, I yes, understand. in that moment, connecting with my father c- cured a kind of feeling that I might yes. have tried to cover up. That's with, what I got. Whether it's food, sex. Right. I don't do drugs or drink anymore, but right. yeah. those, that's all sort of that's left for me is sex and food. Yeah. I don't rage. I don't overspend. I don't gamble to a debilitating degree. You're young yet. Huh? <laughs> you're young yet. Yeah. Um, not that I get so uh, I don't care that much, but I do want to mention a couple of other people that you've worked with because that it's what? sort of th- I wanted to mention a couple more people that you you worked with, yeah. even though it's a little step back. And what well, one is like uh, in in you mentioned uh, you wrote Wiry Spindell years ago, uh, or rather ten years before you made it. Let's yeah, put it that way. And then yeah, oh okay, as a you wrote it as a book. Yeah, I wrote it as a as a even book. Sent it out. Nobody it. nobody cared. Okay. Yes, so no, like I wouldn't have read it, but I wrote it. To, to publishers, you mean? Yeah, we sent it out to publishers, okay. and everybody, uh, right. you know, hated it. Samantha? I still remember. I still remember. Um, I still remember some quotes from the Uh-oh. rejection letters. I think the uh, the pseudo mammoth, the pseudo brat pack mammoth esque writing left me with an uncomfortable sense of deja vu. I think that was one of the, <laughs> one of the rejection letter quotes. I think that is a compliment. That's a rejection letter? Yeah, yeah I know. I know. Right? Thank it's you. like written for an audience almost, yeah. you know. But you, you know, uh, but in that movie, Samantha, my friend Samantha Buck is in it. Samantha Buck? Yeah. Yeah, she was amazing. She's, uh, she's been on this podcast, she was, too. She, yeah, you know, she's so she's good. She's a producer yeah, and she a director. Yeah, she was so good, yeah. Yeah, but, she's really good. She, she immortalized a, a certain girlfriend I had back at Bard. Mm-hmm. Um, and her character in that, in that role she played was yeah. based on a specific person I, I'd gone to college with. Um, she was great. She yeah. was perfect. Anyway, so I just remember. I, I think I didn't know that when I was watching until I started watching the film. Yeah, she's she's a friend, and uh, she made a, a documentary with a friend, of, another friend of mine. Oh, cool. Yeah, uh, a couple Tell years. Her I said I. I w- well, yeah, next yeah. time I see her, I sure will. Do you? Oh, and then I was kind of curious. Oh, Yolanda Ross. She's been on the show too. Uh, she's, she's great. She's she was amazing. John, yeah. John Sales actually. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm always so excited to see this people that are gap. in my yeah. films. Alumni yeah. and that go on to do amazing yeah. things. It's, yeah. I feel like a proud father. Mind the gap, right? That was mind the gap. And then also, yeah. John Hurd was in that. Yeah, John Hurd was in that, and he was also in Gravity. Oh, the, the TV show he played. Okay. Kristen Ritter's father. So you must have gotten known. Kristen Ritter well. was in Gravity. A little bit, you know, well, not, not super well, but a little bit. And he he was, uh, you know, it's like one of so guys. sad. Yeah, I know that he died, and you know, so young and. I tried to uh, the other night. I was supposed. To, I was given a ticket. I couldn't. I ended up being really late, and then I heard she was the director of this this one off screening at the Quad. Uh, Joan Micklin Silver. Mm-hmm. You, you've heard of her. Yeah, yeah, of course. And she she worked with him on uh, Chili Scenes of Winter. And I was I, I wanted to have her on anyway because she's another just you know been around for so long. She's an older woman now, and she had worked with him. And I was thinking oh, it would be nice to get her to talk about John Hurt because she must have through the making of that that film. Yeah, he's just so good. I mean, I mean, he, you know, he's one of the people that I've worked with when he was already a very yeah, famous, course. established actor, right. like Jeffrey Tambor, like Jill Claiborne. Yeah. You know, I, I've been lucky. I mean, Jill listen, Ben, Ben Stiller and, and and Sarah Jessica were certainly well established and famous when I cast them in Lucy Fell. It's not like Scarlett Johansson or Sterling Brown or right. Liz Reeser or some of the people that that hadn't been as established. So, I'm I'm a, you know, I'm a fan. Yeah, so when sure. I meet people. And get to work with people like that that I've yeah. that I've Jill Claver, been right. a fan of, right? You know, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So John John was in that category. Sure, yeah, makes sense, and I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, these are people that are in you know, in those movies you grew up with. Yeah, first of all, yeah, like uh, an unmarried woman, right? Yeah, for Jill, yeah, unmarried woman, and Duh. and for John Hurt, I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, right. yeah, of course. Uh, what just Home Alone? <laughs> Although maybe, <laughs> I think we were already we're we're you're back. already a filmmaker yeah. by then. Uh, Oh, and, and also in, in, in Starved, you worked with Neil Huff, who I, I know. He's another, well. another ridiculously amazing yeah. and talented actor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's been on here, too. Yeah, he's fantastic. He, yeah. he played such a, a crazy role of a, of a breatharian. Of a what? A, a breatharian, which is, uh, oh. they're the people that, that believe that you shouldn't or don't have to eat any food, that you can get all your sustenance just from the sun. <laughs> okay. I got an air. I really do have to. 
So literally, you have literally, my, but literally. Oh, they do exist. Yeah. For real. Yeah, no food or water. Well, no, maybe water, but sunlight and air. I mean, listen, I, I, I looked cursorily into it. I, I don't believe that's possible to live very long that way. I mean, I th- heard three days without water, you're dead, and maybe 50 days with food, you can live, but without food, yeah, whatever it is. Is it is it a fasting, or are you saying... No, no it's they, a this lifestyle. This is a life commitment. And so no Debbie Cakes, apparently. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think the Brother Aaron's eat Debbie <laughs> That's Cakes. not part of... I don't think they do, but uh, no Nemo's. But, uh-huh. um, right. Uh, but yeah, he played a Breatharian, and, uh, and like, brilliantly. Oh, my God. I got to catch up. So please do... I don't know how you would make that available to me. Starved? Yeah, oh, just yeah, in, no, in, in your I have series. A few. Starved, unfortunately, isn't... It breaks my heart, but it's not... It's gettable on YouTube. People have downloaded it onto oh, okay. YouTube, right. but we could never put it out in any DVD or you thing. You mean be- like any of the platforms? Right, because post- we didn't clear... Because I, I love music so much, and I was lucky uh, enough to get this amazing score from Mona Lisa's and Mad Hatter's Elton John song yeah, right. to like all this incredible music that cost a lot, so sure. we only could clear it for broadcast... Understood. We couldn't clear it for in perpetuity. Per- per- perpetuity, right. I so understand. the that good sucks. news was we got I got this amazing so how does score. It get on YouTube then if it has the songs. Because people rip it off and illegally put it on there. I know, but usually YouTube has the you know the algorithms or whatever it is in there that strip. Yeah, that, luckily that, that hasn't it. happened. Oh. Yeah. So, so it's on YouTube. All right, I'll check it out. Yeah. Unofficially. We're I have a couple episodes I'll, I'm happy to send you on my okay. Vimeo page, but I oh, couldn't okay. find them all. All right. Also, did you make an unofficial or official sequel to My Life? Yeah, yeah, we made. It's called They're Out of the Business. Yeah, well, yeah. Donnie I, and I made I, that's another a, one a sequel that IFC, radar. that IFC bought and okay. put out. How did I miss it? Yeah, know. it was 2011. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's 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 Donnie and I 20 years later. Right. Same characters, mm-hmm. Splick and Jason, and mm-hmm. uh, and the conceit is he's been writing his novel for 20 years mm-hmm. that he hasn't published i've been off having my little independent film career and television show career and i mm-hmm. get fired from my eating disorder show <laughs> right on xf the station xf <laughs> that's very subtle yes no. <laughs> listen i'm very grateful that fx for putting my show on but but and it, and there's a joke about how my and my agent fires me everyone fires me i'm mm-hmm. back in new york living with my mom and i call him up and say look it's been 20 years we must get together and make another movie and he's like stay away from me and so the conceit is that we've had uh, a falling out. Oh, okay. That's, and we, that's funny. And, and I convince him yeah. that we should get back together and make another film. One more. And so it's, since we already did the movie about making a movie, mm-hmm. even though the conceit is that we're going to get together and make another film, it's really about two guys in their 40s trying to sort of recreate their sure. lives. They're, they're both stuck. Women. And. Relationships. Right. And, and, so, and they're estranged. Yes. And, and so, so it's about right. friendship, yeah. rekindling friendship. Right. At 40, how you have relationships that work with women try to right. at 40. Yeah. And so, listen, of course I love the movie, you know, yeah. we love the movie. So yeah, you should watch it. I will. You, no, totally, yeah, totally I mean, into it. I'm going to, certainly fact, if you like my life I've got to find, uh, I got to find um, my life's a turnaround first and rewatch it. Listen, it's I wish I, I have like, I don't even know if you have a DVD player anymore, but I have I do. stacks of these things in the closet. So I'm happy to give you whatever I have. Sure. I wish I yeah. should have thought to bring them, but oh no, I but I'll get them to you. No, no, but it's there's like that. I'd love to have a copy of that. Yeah, and um, you know, I, uh, most of the others, most of your other features are very easy to get. Most of them. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they're all either on they're Amazon all, or iTunes. Right. You know, um, Netflix, whatever. What the only you? one that's a little hard, which makes me very sad, is Never Again, which is Jill Clayburgh and Jeffrey Tambor. Right. right. Um, and since they both have passed, it's uh, no, I can't. It's a terrible thing to do. No, don't about. say that. Um, and so that because, <laughs> you know, Focus bought it. It was it was actually. Focus's first title after becoming, I forget the name of the company that they were before they were Focus, but um, mm, they, not, um, they were USA Films. Oh, they were okay. USA Films, and then they became Focus. Focus Features. And uh, they just, they didn't, I don't think they made it into HD because it costs money, so a lot of titles that these companies make don't right. HDify them. Right. And if they're not HD... No platform will air them. Right, right, at this stage. If they don't pay the 10 grand or whatever it costs to make them into HD, Netflix, Hulu, iTunes, no one will put it on. Interesting. 
So they it's sort of kind of a double edged sword in that that regard right. because it's good to have this I guess the, the standards that you're not going to get some crap like we used to get such crappy. I remember this is the you know I'm not going to keep you much longer. Try to respect your time, which I've already no, no, uh, listen, I'm I've just abused. I have to pee really badly, but that's what, that's <laughs> well, the only you should I'm... not let that stop you. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. So I was going to say <laughs> one time Mike Mike Lee, who's like you know got, like oh, the, one, you know Mike Lee. Yeah. So I remember the first time. I was going to interview him, not for this podcast, because I just, but it was for some some like I used to write articles for different websites and Tribeca, and, and I and uh, I got Mike Lee, and I thought it was before we were both standing in the early. I, I ran into him in the green room at the, you know Walter Reed or wherever uh-huh. it was, and I thought okay, I'm going to impress him because I watched all his teleplays. You know, I really watched everything, yeah, and yeah. I'm going to talk to him about that and really you know impress him. Yes, that you that you you <laughs> so, know the early. Yeah, so I mentioned it. We really like your films, especially the earlier funny ones, which is no, a no, line no, no, from no. Yes. Stardust from, Memories, from, the, the runner from Stardust Memories. Right. I, don't, yeah. I remember that. Too. And I said, no, no, I didn't put it in that way. I, it was a fan all the way through. I said, even I've even seen all your teleplays. I've recently caught up with all of them. Like, you know, and he just, his face fell. He grimaced. He goes, and he was really angry because of all the rotten, rotten versions that ended up on. Really? Like they were on Netflix mm-hmm. streaming, but they were really horrible copies like they've done beautiful restorations in the uk but so he just it started off like you know with that that was the way I, oh god that's it, so he sad. Was, it was fine no the rest of the he conversation nice. we was, got better yeah. even though he's he's not the easiest but he's uh-huh. fine he's fine and then but yeah uh, but some maybe on the next film i happen to have another opportunity to talk to him and uh for some reason i felt this is how bad i can be as a i felt compelled to remind him like I thought it was going to be funny. Like uh, I'm going to tell you. Like by the way, you know, the last time I saw you, I told I wanted to impress you, and I w- told you how about these, you know. Yeah, you just dug yourself your in deeper. And you then know, he like, just yeah. Once down. again, he just yeah. thought he just uh, you know got frustrated <laughs> know. about. No, there's so certain it didn't yeah, help. yeah. Listen, we I'm just you know, but people, I'm going to do it again. I don't want to say we artists. It sounds so so uh, pretentious. Yes. No. So I don't want to say we artists, but people who do this, what I do, you know, you have yeah. to be careful because we're just so. Uh, terrified and self-hating i'm not saying mike lee is i know i can speak for myself that you know the little we we get our panties in a bunch about the sure i try not to but we can so even when you try anyway um if i get another opportunity which i hope i do because i'd like to get him on the podcast because i really do love mike lee yeah i, 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 I but i will bring it up again it, yeah no ha- now at this point I, you yeah, have to it's at this sort point, of yeah it's going to be your it's, you're just going to kick that fucking dead horse it's until it's until and it he's going to want you yeah. for sure <laughs> So I want to know, though, I mean, what's, is there stuff that you can talk about or anything that, that you're working on that, Yeah, yeah, you know, well, thank or? you for asking. I, there's, you know, Boy Meets Girl came out three, came out a year and a half ago. Yes. So we Which, shot it three years ago. So, you know, these things always take like three years to make, uh, shoot, come out, promote, and then it feels like the baby has grown up enough that it's time to move to the next one, at least for me. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm sort of itching to, to, to make the next thing. And I think that's going to be one of a couple of things. I'm going to, you know, I ha- I want to make, I've, I have a title that's been in my head for a couple of years, which is 50 is the New Dead, which I just love because turning 50 and now I'm 55, even hopefully I, you know, whatever. I look whatever I look. Some people say I look younger. But you definitely, I, I was going to say what, for those who uh, are listening. <laughs> you know, the point is, is that whatever I mean, you, you, feeling, yeah. you know, at least feeling, ten years younger, and also being a at white, least, if not, yeah, middle aged, middle class man in the world today mm-hmm. is a very interesting proposition, and comes with uh, a bunch of characteristics that can be mm-hmm. challenging. And so, I'm interested in how the world's working now in terms of the diversity of culture, the uh-huh. diversity of of power. Uh-huh power exchange in our country in our world um and again just my personal you know it's just really interesting i mean i went up for a job and i was told i couldn't get it because i'm not a minority or women owned business so you know listen obviously it's a big conversation you know Mm -hmm. and i'm I'm not crying over spilled milk but i'm just saying my reality is what it is Mm -hmm. and so um Discussing again what it is to be fifty and a white man in New York City in two thousand and seventeen yeah, yeah. is something that's interesting to me, and mm-hmm. I think would be interesting again to other people, even in the fact that it's not interesting to a lot of people. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it's interesting because um, 
show I'm supposed to put up today, which I may be quite late doing, is actually was a last minute decision to move this up because uh, is one of this filmmaker's earlier films is going to be on POV uh-huh. next week. So I wanted to make sure I promoted that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a film that was made a while ago, but they were doing like a um, whatever a special broadcast of it. Uh, anyway. He's always made these socially progressive documentaries, you know, and he comes from that background. But his new project is called The Whiteness Project. It's, mm. You can see it on, online. It's, I mean, it's just in the very beginning, uh, but they're doing an incredible amount of, of interviewing and data collection. And it's, it's all about what it does for those who identify as white in this country. <laughs> yeah. And it's like a sociological experiment but it's so it's all it's going to all be online this this project it's not going to be like a cool you know theatric but it's called the whiteness project and i mean it's not it's all you know it's about privilege but it's also about much more because it's asking white people what it is to be white right in this so i know there's some of it's up already a little bit yeah it's interesting i love making boy meets girl because it was about listen yeah i'm i'm interested in, in telling stories as i said sort of if there's a thesis if there's a a mandate uh-huh a life thesis or life mandate so far it's that's been a through line through all my work is this thing of being disenfranchised and trying to create unity mm-hmm. among people who feel disenfranchised mm-hmm. and the reason people ask me and, and never again how do you write a 70 year old woman a 65 year old woman you're not that person with boy meets girl how do you write a transgender 21 year old you're not that person mm-hmm. and the answer is so simple it's like because i i i i, I patently feel that you know, comparing our insides is what is important and what we identify with, regardless of the shell that we live in, mm-hmm. of gender, of race, of sexual orientation, of age, of privilege, of class. You know, if, if money and privilege bequeathed wisdom and happiness, the Kennedy family would be in, have right. a different historical... Sure evolution mm-hmm. right yeah i mean they wouldn't be blowing that you know yeah so it's we know full that of tragedy that's not right. right family yeah the formula for happiness right so and concurrently you know you can be born listen again so it's so it's fun for me to make movies about people that are so different looking than me so different circumstantially from me mm-hmm. but that I can still identify with because in some way they feel disenfranchised. So as much as I'd like to make a a movie about a 50-year-old white guy, and I might do that, I might also make a movie about um, a 75-year-old black man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really want to make movies about people that are very, very different than me as well. Right. But there's a universal... Yes. The feelings are... Right. Because because I also think that's the way to open people's eyes a little bit and go, oh, my God. Mm Mm-hmm. You feel like I do, yet we look totally yeah, different. Right, right. I mean, it's yeah. so obvious. But um, well, actually, you and I, not in the case, but <laughs> so New York City. That's Jewish what I think I want to. I, I want to write next. Okay. I've also wanted to. Uh, for years, I've wanted to make a wiry spindel about a female character. Huh. So the same format, uh-huh. kind of a woman who's maybe in her thirties, and we sort of flash back and see her whole life that leads to the circumstances that she's in at 30 mm-hmm. um, in a way that's maybe a little more honest and revealing than a lot of female stories that have been out there so far. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, someone would say, listen, there's this whole th- idea now that I think is ridiculous that, in, that unless you're the person, you cannot tell that story. Right, yeah. Which just makes no sense to me. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, yeah. Because isn't that discrimination? It's crazy. Yeah. So that does that mean that any actor who's actually gay in his life can't play a straight guy? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the reverse version of it, right? You know, and as much as I really wanted to hire a transgender woman to yeah. play the lead in Boy Meets Girl, I was lucky enough that I found a brilliant transgender actress. Had I not, I would not have cast hmm. a transgender actress oh, really? who wasn't as good as a cisgender a yeah. person. Yeah. I wouldn't have. Uh, and that's why I think it's ridiculous that Jeffries, who's brilliant, like just knocked down brilliant and transparent. Yeah, um, it's amazing. It's just a... You know, yeah. uh, if I'm sure the producers audition transgender women for the role as well. I and, don't know. Uh, you know. It's not about that, though. It's kind of, it is about his journey, though, so it had to be. I mean, it's a little different. That's true, too. 
we're in an interesting, sensitive stage. It's not quite where we were when we were going to school back in the no. 80s and there was this, you know, the politically correctness. It's not quite there. It's a similar, there's some similarities there, but we're in a very sensitive moment right now where, you know, Sofia Coppola gets a lot of crap because she didn't cast black people as slaves in her story. Uh, you know, you read about that in, in the remake of... Uh, no. But uh, so she's getting the uh, I don't know she, the seat what is it called really? the, the uh, she's getting a hard time. Well, it's about this you know these young girls at this school in uh, in it's all girls school in the South during the civil at the at tail end of the Civil War, and uh, you know this soldier this um, northern soldier who you know one of the girls finds wounded and mm-hmm. takes back and then it's what happens over the next few days and. Um, but you know, there she got a lot of criticism because she didn't include any uh, slave characters that would have should have been there. But um, yeah, so listen, she had to go on it, it and goes explain herself. To, like it, yeah. it's just like a level of listen, oversensitivity. You and I, I don't. I, I feel like it's, it's some, like an extension of what we're talking about. Yeah, ridiculous old fogey cliche of well, we grew up in a different time. But but I will say that it goes full circle to what we started off talking by by saying how bad I felt that I tried to convince the Korean boy to eat a. A piece of a dirt brownie, you know, yeah, it's yeah. like I feel scared and bad to even say that to you because, oh, my God, will that get blown? And ex- out of really? Oh, that occurred to you? Well, yeah, it occurred oh, to me. Wow. Oh, my God. Is the headline going to be? Yeah, right. Racist <laughs> Eric Schaefer talks about how he abused Asian people. Yeah. In 1977, you know, and of of course not. But the fact that that even occurs to me by telling an anecdotal story uh, about a boy who happened to be Asian and. Yes. And it could have easily been me, and I got abused by all kinds of different people, black, white. Yeah. Um, You didn't discriminate about who you let beat you up. That's very kind (laughs) of you. See how open you are. So, yeah. So, listen. (laughs) But I certainly understand. That's not to say I don't understand the sensitivity Mm -hmm. and the need for perspective to radically change about a lot of things in our world. Of course, that's true. But what's also true is I think there can be a kind of a boomerang effect that isn't good for any of us, which yes. is the kind of, you know, extremist point of view I think is extremist that um, doesn't serve us. Yeah, that you yeah. can't tell a story unless you're the exact person. Right. It just make you know. So what does that and what does that do to all the the great writers, filmmakers, authors of the past? Does that mean they had no business that those stories yeah. are now right. rendered kind right. of ridiculous right. because yeah. Shakespeare wasn't who he was writing about exactly. And, and can a woman, the, well, can a woman the, not write a story about a man? Can yeah. she not have any male characters in her book? No, I mean, is that yeah. Just yeah. ridiculous? Well, we're, ca- we're 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 grappling with it, but well, let's keep a sense of humor and also and just a sense be, of a common a, sense. Yeah, about yeah it. right. And we're you're right. Exactly. Be, be sensible about it. Exactly. But I so. also understand that. Listen, I learn a. Lo- I, I thank God I'm. You know, listen, I learn a lot about quote unquote common sense. Yeah. And I and my my you know my girlfriend, who's has taught me a lot. You know, uh-huh. uh, a lot of people teach me a lot. You know, be making the the transgender, the film with a transgender star in it. I mean, again, mm-hmm. being thinking I'm whatever you want to call it, liberal, New Yorker, Democrat. You know, I've learned. Uh, I still have much, much to learn about things that I take for granted that can still be hurtful sure. in sure. my speech and my point of view. Yeah. So, well, you- I agree with all that. You haven't, I just yeah. think there's a there's a line where it also can be destructive to the overall goal of us all well, it sounds just like getting a, along. Sounds like a good thing to have in a movie as well, or a good you know theme for a film as well. Yeah. Anyway, well, I right. appreciate. Man, Listen, I love talking to you, and I really this appreciate you wanting to talk to me. Yeah. No, I I, I just <laughs> I just also immediately just felt uh, not so surprisingly very just familiar. Maybe it's just. Yeah. Well. Cause, cause, because uh, you know maybe it's also partly the persona that you give off in the films that you make, and the but also just you're very easy to talk to. Well, thanks. Well, thanks. So are you. I appreciate it. Thank I, you. I appreciate you not turning, doing what you said you were going to do, which is <laughs> right to be super nice and friendly, and then yeah, the thing goes on, and then suddenly it's yeah. And I, I would be if any if I ever heard anybody even speaking slightly uh, amiss about you. Now I feel a sense of of, of uh, defense. What's the word? Ownership, not ownership, but right. I understand what you're trying to opl- say. Well, op- I appreciate. Uh, that. Yeah, so I would, I would uh, put say that. You didn't seem like such a put, bad chap to me. Yeah, I, like no, that. I would totally be. Well, I well that. that's not that's not the guy I know. Yeah, yeah. So 
There we go. And oh, I hope good. you do the same yeah, for me. Yeah, I would listen. I would love to. I would love to. Thank you. All right, Eric. We'll do this again sometime. Maybe with a new film when it comes when you yeah, when you do have yeah. a new something we can we can yeah. actually. Also yeah, and again, you push. know, like I'm also amazingly someone twittered me that loved Boy Meets Girl, who's a incredible. This is great. Singer. I mean, uh, are we gonna? Yeah, this is classic New York. Let's like yeah, wait. We for are. The, but, uh, to well, the thing people. is, when you make low budget films, they're like wait for the beeps. I'm like, yeah. we would add those beeps anyway. <laughs> right for New York yeah. ambiance, we're, of course. So of let's course. just get it as part of people, the production track. We're looking over the Hudson River. Let's just uh, uh, it's it's uh, <laughs> heading towards the um, end of the day. Right, we're heading. It's, yeah, magic light, and we have two New York City trucks, um, park, park trucks, trucks who have a lot of. Um, clippings from trees in them. Yep. I learned a lot about the trees when I was on the chain gang for a <laughs> week for my oh. community service for being arrested for felony bribery, uh, trying to get out of a red light ticket, which was immortalized in my life's turnaround. Oh. And so, so yeah, that's I learned how that these been. trees here are called Australian pines. Oh. We don't have any. They have quills in them that you'll uh-huh. see that keep the koala bears from climbing up and eating the buds. That's always a problem at Riverside Park, by yeah, the way. Yeah, but no, but you never notice no, them. I understand. But these went, so, um, are, we, are we off? You took no, off no, your no, headset, no. So I, I just took like them off, off because I, anyway. I, I was uh, hard to stand up. So, yeah, so I learned a lot. F- I bet. About them. They're not right here, but they're far, a little farther down, and they have these little huge that's, quills coming that's out. That's not the Australian pine. No, you would see them. They have these quills that come out of their... The trunks. Oh, okay. So, no, so uh, they're now farther down. They're on the up. next stretch. So it's amazing. But look, and then you'll notice. It's the kind of I thing will. you don't really notice look. unless you've been arrested for felony bribery and have to do your community service in Riverside <laughs> Park. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Well, you're going to have to get me the copies now. Uh, you really yeah, yeah, are. I'll, I'll get you as much as I can. Uh, oh, before we get off, uh, yeah. oh, thank you. By the way. Thanks for doing this. It was thanks, great to talk for, to you. Thanks for coming. Could now do the, one of those, uh, if you wouldn't mind, yeah. it, uh, like uh, ID type things where sure. you just say so uh, it's Eric Schaefer. Well, the name of the show is Film Wax Radio. Hi, this is Eric Schaefer, and I'm on Film ra- Film Film Wax Radio. Why do you make such a hard thing to say? For I don't know. It's, it's, it's say that three times fast. I want you to. Say I can it. say it three say times. It. F- I can't do it. Film, say I'm. I'm. I'm Eric Schaefer. No, you say you. Your name, and I'm. The, I'm. I'm the host uh, this of, is right. This is Adam Shartoff. I'm the host of Film Wax Radio. No, film Wax Radio. Fast. Film Wax Radio. Okay. You, well, you're well, much I've said it a few times. Yes. I'm. Uh, you can say it as many times as you want. Hi. To. Th- this is Eric Schaefer. I'm here with Adam on Film Wax Radio. I've been, because one of the things I want to see happen, so I, I'm putting it in my mind, is to host Saturday Night Live. Uh-huh. And I can't say that. I just said it, but I can't say Saturday Night Live. I feel like I don't say it right. Saturday oh, maybe Night Live. it's a psychological block. It's a Saturday block. Night Live. I feel like I mumble. I know. I know say what you mean. It. Saturday Night Live. Well, you're, you so have you to figure it out. Really but well. I do a lot, you know, I don't know. Because what do they come out? Hey, it's trying, great I don't think I'm going to make it on Saturday. I have a lot of dreams. But see, you have good enunciation. I'm going to do it. And say, hey. I know, no. You should listen to the show. I, I fumble over my words so all, here's what I would so say. much. Let's say, I'm, hi, hi, I'm Eric Schaefer. I'm so excited to be here hosting Saturday Night Live. See? Yeah. So then but, I think... But that sounds... But you but hear you some people say NSL. SNL. ADR. No, they say SNL. And I think maybe oh. those times, those people can't say it either. Maybe. That's what it is. It's that so exciting be. to be here hosting Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Does that sound all right? It sounded perfect. Yeah. I've had dreams where I hosted it, but I also had dreams that wow. I went out with Madonna and that never happened. So... <laughs> It's, again, not too late. No, I don't think it is too late. <laughs> no, I hold that out as a... As a I'm writing a film don't for Broadway possibly. Video right now, actually, and Paramount. Oh, okay. So that's a cool thing that I'm, I'm you writing. You buried the lead. I don't want to... Yeah. So that's... <laughs> I forgot about that. That's okay. something that hopefully... Well, it's because good. I, wanna, we'll I talk think about of studio time. projects as being such mm-hmm. a crapshoot. So... Right. Because I can't control it. I, I can't say we're going to start filming tomorrow. Mm-hmm. But that's something that's really exciting. Also, you probably maybe are not... You shouldn't be talking about the project like that. Maybe they would... No, no. Well, I, I'm not going to say exactly what it's about, but it's it's sort of, it's about ageism. Oh, okay. It's about ageism. All right. So it's sort of about what to we feel were talking that, uh, about. I'm starting to feel uh, I know what ageism is about. Cause, uh, yeah. But that's another. Well, it's about this idea of like yeah. 50 is a new death. That's sort of what's in yeah. hap- happening now. It's the idea, and, not just the white thing, but just. kind of disappear, like being invisible. You know, it's like, uh, I, I never had that. Now, well, sometimes I have to really be careful. You know, it started for me 12 years ago. Well, I guess it's ten year, nine years ago that Obama got. When, did it, when was it McCain? Was that the first race or the second one? That was. The first one. The. First uh, one was the McCain. Was, the second one was. What's his name? Uh, Dol- what? Yeah. Who uh, did he run against the first time? McCain. The second time he ran against, oh my God, who was the the, the, the billionaire? You know, oh the <laughs> Ted Danson. What's no, his name? yeah, yeah, yeah. John Kerry. No, no, what? no, no. The no, good no, no, no. Mitt Romney. Mitt was that the guy? Mitt. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay, so that was the, that was the f- so nine years ago when John second time when I remember I was on the exercise. Bike. No, no, was the first time the first was one? McCain. Yeah, yeah. So sure. McCain right. nine years ago. Right? Yeah, eight and a half years ago, something like that. I was shocked, and here's when I knew that it was starting radically for ageism in uh-huh. America. I watched CNN, and a graphic popped up, and they kind of didn't really discuss the fallout, but eighty percent of America. America, mm-hmm. not New York, not blue states. America, red yeah, states. Yeah. 80% would rather see a black man than a 70-year-old white man in the White House. Hmm. And at that point, and I wrote an article for Huffington Post called Old is the New Black. But what happened? But I'm saying, think about that. Yeah. No, I, I know, That's but, but redneck racists in wherever they live going, no, I'd rather have the, the N-word, N-word dude in there yeah, right. rather than know, my then grandfather. What happened? You know what I mean? Then they had, got him, though, and then that's when they changed their mind back to old people. But isn't that cra- isn't that revealed? I mean, this. doesn't that suddenly? I guess so, but I don't know. I don't. I don't buy into. Any I don't of know that in anymore. America and that they wouldn't want to talk about white privilege. Mm-hmm. They threw away the war hero white seventy-year-old guy. That right. isn't that the poster child for white privilege? Yeah, they threw that guy well, away for, for a black for... man. Thank God. Right. In that, in my political view, in that particular race, nothing against John McCain, but I'm just saying. Well. My choice would have been Barack Obama. Yeah, for sure. And but, was. But I have a lot to say. But just in John terms McCain. of what America thought, mm-hmm. I was found that kind of shocking. And so then I thought, wow, okay. That's when it first went on your Yeah, went on radar. my radar in a mm-hmm. big way that if America, and again, that's not just the blue states. <laughs> it's 80% of everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Saying, you know what? Regardless of my point of view, and I'm I'm going to go put my white Ku Klux Klan thing on and go to my Klan rally. I'm still going to yeah. vote for the but black we're gonna, guy. But they're all going to be yeah. young people under those sheets. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's it's yeah. a, I think now more than ever, um, and having parents that are getting older, and yeah, you know, and what does old mean? You know, fifty. Again, well, it's a state of mind more than anything. But well, but I mean, in terms of, of being hired. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. I don't know. I'm not even sure anymore. I just decided to make my own now. Open, like create my own business. <laughs> well, that's what I had well, to. I mean, I had. But to. that's what I'm saying. But yeah. and that is actually in a weird me. way. Mm-hmm. The upside of the downside mm-hmm. is that. So yeah, that if right. the downside is that it's like millennial, and now I've learned Gen, Gen Z is even younger than millennial. That's your son is Gen Z. Uh-huh. Um, Good to know. And internet and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. The upside is old people can start their own business because of that. Right, so we're lucky. I, I hope I'm not that, old. That the very people but, yeah. that are sort of outsourcing us mm-hmm. have created a way that we oh, can right, yeah, right. insource ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, but it's just too much work. I thought you were, we were supposed I, to I, get so, no, some tenure. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, weren't I you supposed to be oh, given so, shit after you work for thirty well, years? I'm just hoping somebody hires me ultimately, anyway, based on all the good work I do with my. But own that's what I'm saying. Because <laughs> I got the way it. It works I don't have much time left. All right. to waste. All right, I have to pee so badly. Oh man, let's go. I'm sorry about that.